We're talking hacking, automated security. And I got a question for you, Brian. Give me just some good advice on automating security. Know what the output of the automation is going to be before you hit go. Might sound simple, but not enough people do. It is a simple, it's simple, but mm -hmm. good tip. All right. I, I want you to do the opposite for me, Ken. Uh, give me some bad advice on automating security. You automate full network containment based on a simple alert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Brian, one up him. Give me some worse advice. Uh, Make your entire automation suite on PowerShell and Excel. Ooh, ouch. That's not good. Get ready. <laughs> it's Super Cyber Friday. All right, everybody. It is time for Super Cyber Friday. Today's topic of conversation is going to be hacking automated security. And this has been a long time. We have not done a show in a full month. It's our first show in 2023. Let me get through this as quickly as possible. It's an hour of critical thinking of how intelligent automation can achieve more without actually doing more because we've had heard the issue and we'll address it of if you want to automate, you actually have to hire more when it's been sold the complete opposite. Hey, my guests are Ken Collins, who's a senior director of information security over at Sunbelt Rentals, and also Brian Vecchi, who's the field CTO over at Veronis. Hey, they're our sponsor today, Veronis. Veronis has been a absolutely spectacular sponsor of the CISO series. So we're thrilled that we're doing this again with them. Uh, all right, seven different ways to participate. I don't need to read it all to you, but I just want to mention what the bad idea and the good idea or the 10% better is. Um, how not to automate. That is your bad idea. We want tip or your bad ideas on how not to automate and 10% better tips on how to improve security automation as well. Here's our schedule for today. Um, you know, get your bad ideas in within the, the first 20 minutes specifically. Uh, then we'll play the public interest. Uh, we will vote on how not to automate. Your vote counts when we play later, the Department of Yes. And then we will do our meetup at the end of the show. Please stick around for the meetup. It is the most fun portion because you get to have face-to-face -face time with your fellow cyber pros. Uh, our next show is going to be next Friday. We're back in the swing of it, doing it every Friday. It's going to be hacking cloud forensics. This is actually a really super fascinating topic of, uh, you know, think about like all the complicated things you need to know in cloud to do security. How much of that could you automate? So if you're interested in this topic of automation, you're going to be interested in that topic as well. Guess what? Click the link at the bottom of the screen. You can register for it and you will not be taken out of this discussion. So go ahead and remember if you register early, you are automatically entered in a raffle to win a CISO series jacket. Huge congrats to this week's winner, winner, Joe Kinslow of Vibrant Cyber. Way to go, Joe. All right, let's, uh, let me close this out and let us begin our discussion. And I actually alluded to this earlier, uh, and I'm going to start with you, Brian, on this, because I know I've asked you about this, but Walk me through what we have been sold in automation, what we've already been doing on automation that may, people may not realize, and what is the reality at this point in automation? Well, oh, the, the, a lot of really big questions. Um, so, I mean, automation makes sense. Everybody needs to do more with less, which is the easiest thing that not just CISOs, but you can say to almost any, anybody, right? We all have and limited and resources who, who and we'd like to accomplish more. That? Yeah, it's an it's easy like thing to say. Everybody likes so, puppies and everybody likes automation. Yeah. So when you say automation has been oversold, of course it has, because it's the easiest thing to sell somebody. I'm going to be able to automate stuff that you are either not able to do now, uh, that would take years uh, and you don't have the resources to do it, or you are, and that can free your, uh, your, your people up to do uh, more things. And of course we can automate lots of things. Like just think about how complex our networks are, how much is automated when you just log in, right. Versus what, 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 what used to happen. But um, when you, when you, when you think about automation, when you're being sold automation and, Ken's going to have a lot to say about this because he mm -hmm. gets sold <laughs> a lot of automation. <laughs> um, it's 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 important to understand kind of what you're actually automating. When we were, you know, Ken's, you know, what's the worst idea? He said, um, and I love this. And whenever somebody says something smart, I'm going to steal it. So I'm telling you, Ken, right now, I'm going to steal it. So, <laughs> like, what's a bad idea? Shut off your network from an alert. Well, alerts are going to have false positives. It's just a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> I used to say I could automate all of your data security risk. I can get it to zero. I'll just delete all your data. Right. No more risk. Risk is gone. Automation is only as good as the steps you're going to take and how intelligent those steps are. We've been able to automate a lot. We'll be able to automate more in the future. But if you're buying automation or if you're implementing automation, you need to know it's, it's this concept of garbage in, garbage out. 
what are the what's the information what's the intelligence that you're using to make the changes that you're going to automate and do you really understand them and are they smart enough that the output is useful and isn't dangerous or uh, detrimental or causes more damage than good that it uh <laughs> more damage than good i think i hope all that makes a little bit of sense it does very much all right i want to throw this to you ken um what is the bill of goods that you have been so there's two issues here in being sold automation one is the vendors come to you and sell it but then at the same point you got to sell it to your business as well so where's the happy space everyone should be well when you, when you think about automation there's a couple of things you think about detection you think about response in the cyberspace and detection is questions you're trying to answer and that's actually not too hard i mean it can be right. challenging for the systems the response side is a predefined decision that you had, can work through manually and you can do. That's the part that sold and oversold more than I have seen in any other world because they make that decision seem so easy. The technology to configure it is a challenge, but it's actually the trivial part. Mm -hmm. The actual execution of that without a human involved is is actually, um, what, what I look at it is, is like the the cure is worse than the disease at times. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm oversold that it's simple to do, do it in minutes, it's reliable, and it will cut your staff in half. And yeah, 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 that, that we know. You, you actually have more staff to support the automation and more mm -hmm. risk to manage, you've just shifted it. What you've gotten out of it is speed, efficiency, reliability, and that's wonderful, but you need to go into it with your eyes wide open and not just buy some piece of software thinking that's going to solve your problems because frankly it's going to exasperate them yes all right um are we uh we oh by the way please ask questions everybody i didn't uh, tell you to ask questions go ahead and ask questions uh, and i'm interested to know where you are the audience is successful with automation as well so where is let me ask you brian where is a good place an obvious place to start and where should we be pushing ourselves in automated uh, in security automation? Like, because remediation really is the thing that everybody wants. And as much it's as interesting, as possible. of course, remediation is the thing that everybody wants, but it, going back to how do we define what, what's remediation? So uh, Ken knows because, you know, we've talked before the way, the way we, and when I say we, I mean, Veronis, when we talk about remediation, it's getting rid of open access and getting rid of, uh, permissions that aren't needed yeah, and yeah, well, applying that, that labels. Is... But that's that's what remediate. But in some cases, remediation is things like um, just deleting data. I've seen I've seen you know compliance officers that say the remediation step that we want to take is just get rid of data that we don't need. Actually, apply our retention and disposition schedule. Um, I used to ask this question at events when we used to do big in person events, and I'd ask everybody, you know, do you have a retention schedule or retention and disposition policy for your data? And every single hand would go up. Looking at the chat, I bet every single hand will go up. Do you have a retention policy? Now, how many of you actually enforce it? And every single hand goes down because nobody wants to be the person. Yes, nobody wants yes. to be the person that <laughs> takes something away that the HR department needs from eight years ago, whatever it might be. Might be. So, you know, the the question of what's so, the easiest can thing I, to can automate. I pause you on that because that is something I'm sure everyone deals with. Mm -hmm. Is the but what if we need it sometime? Data is mm -hmm. cheap to store, but expensive to retain given the, or because of the, the security risk. So yeah, but what's the risk of keeping it, issue? right? Yeah, so I address it this way. What's the risk of keeping it? Because that entire statement is predicated on the idea that there is very little or no cost to keeping it. So why delete it? I might need it someday, so I'm not going to get rid of it. But we don't live in a world where keeping data for no reason is zero risk right? That data could be lost or stolen or misused. It represents risk. So if you can defensively delete it and get rid of it, and a lot of these regulations say you have to. I'm not a compliance expert, but I know that you're not supposed to keep my personal data forever just because you can't figure out a way to delete it. So it's this goes back to this question of risk, the impact of loss, theft, or misuse multiplied by the probability of it happening. And you know, the best way to reduce risk to data is get rid of it. So your initial question is, what what's the kinds of things that we can automate? Just get rid of data that you don't need. You need to do it intelligently. You can't just delete everything. But I think that's a really good first step. Ken, have you done that? <laughs> I'll say you, the you guy guy that, in that battle yeah, of, yeah. what have happened um, if we get rid of it and we need it? It's mm -hmm. a constant 
it's a constant battle with the business. To, to your point, they say they need it. And in my world, a record is a record is a record. It doesn't matter if it's 50 years old or one year old. You have to protect it in the same manner, depending on that data type. Um, retention tends to sit in the hands of legal with a lot of companies. And you want to go get a policy. Cool, you get a policy. Then you want to go execute it. And then you go start taking data from people. And then you watch the, the feathers fly. So um, I would say we have just as many struggles as probably everybody that's on this, on this uh, cast right here in, in actually getting molecular about retention. You Granular. Yep. My, my favorite, I had, we had, I was in a conversation with the chief compliance officer, big insurance company, tens of thousands of people. And uh, Ken's going to laugh at this story because uh, he knows that we built our name, our, our company's built on, you know, managing files. That's where we started, unstructured mm -hmm. data, which is huge and massively complex. And I'm trying to explain to her what it is that we do and, and how her company actually uses Veronis and why it exists. And I asked her, it's like, so you log in every morning and you've got, you know, a shared drive, a personal drive. And she said, yeah, I was like, there's probably, you know, legal documents that you work with your team. She's got a big legal team, you know, hundreds of people. She said, yeah. I was like, so how many of those shared folders do you think there are? in your company and she paused for a second she said you know at least a few hundred and i had to show her a slide that said it's actually something like 43 million people that you can build up you can make a policy but a lot of times the people that are making the policies ken to your point don't know how to get molecular about this stuff because they don't understand the complexity of the molecules if that analogy holds up i think it fell apart there but hopefully you get what i'm trying to say no I, this is a really good question that came in from ian pointer and i want to address this one what areas of security do you think are the worst for consideration for automation? I'll start with you, Ken, on this. Um, like, uh, auto like a situation auto of don't go there kind of a thing. Yeah, uh, an auto containment without any human involvement that could disrupt business process. That, that is absolutely the worst. There, if you're hitting a critical system asset that makes them, in my world, my company money, and I automate that containment without a human involvement, without a proper escalation line to our IRP, that would be the worst outcome I could possibly have. Maybe I'm right, but the communication strategy with it is more important than that containment exercise. And if you automate that, there's no way you can get ahead with the communication, the buy-in and the agreement from you know your rapid response team. Before I get your response to this, uh, Luis actually asked a very sort of similar uh, question connected to your response here. Luis Ven Valenzuela asks, how do you alleviate the concerns of the business that automation, quote, you know, in deleting or fixing open access will break business processes and the help desk would be flooded with incidents? I mean, I think it's kind of what you were just saying is that there, you know, like with anything, you'd have to go through a lot, a lot of testing. Yes, Ken? It's no different than, than any other rollout that you may do. Right. You have to pilot you build your partnership with the business, start small, spread out, show success in a certain area, eat your own dog food. Right. Um, it's, I don't think it's any different problem than any other thing you deal with. It's just much more personal to the business side. And it's also a lot harder to get good, clear context to every piece of data because we use the word data very generally, but there's all sorts of different types that you have to work through. So I think it's all in your strategy. All right, I want to go back to the original question to you, Brian, which was, which was uh, uh, Ian's question of, you know, what areas of security just just don't consider for automation, and is it different, same as what? Kind well, of I I'd rephrase the question a little bit. Don't okay. consider for automation. I don't think there's anything that you wouldn't consider for automation, but it's important okay. to do it responsibly. Uh, to Ken's point, taking action without any human involvement at all, there's so so you know we monitor data and we have alerts to data. And we'll alert you when somebody starts accessing a bunch of sensitive data, when it looks like a service account is accessing data in new places, or it looks like a device is under command and control, or when a, an account is uh, encrypting files really, really quickly. So that's one of the most common things that we alert on. Um, all of those are different kinds of alerts that require different kinds of responses that require different levels of automation. They can all, response to that can all be automated in some way. For some things, you probably just want to let somebody know. You want to make sure that somebody knows that, hey, this service account is authenticating to new systems and it looks like the account might be under command and control because it's on a device that it's never been on and it's accessing data that it's never looked at before. Doesn't mean you shut it down. Maybe there's some new business process that I don't know about. 
flip side of that though is, and there was something we did an analysis. It was something like 35 or 38% of our customers use us to automate responses to ransomware only because when we have, when we see clear signals, multiple signals that an account is leaving ransom notes that we know are ransom notes, changing file extensions that we know are ransomware extensions and is doing so in such a rapid way, you kind of, you don't necessarily want to wait for an analyst or a rapid response team to get the email, go to the dashboard, figure out what's going on. You want to shut that thing down. You want to, because the risk of not doing it, the risk of letting it run and taking out the entire NAS, for instance, is higher than the risk of any potential disruption. These are all treated differently. So to your question, which I'm not sure, you, I'm not sure the exact phrasing, I think the most dangerous thing that we can do from an automation standpoint is to treat like all automation or all alerts equally and not right. put and not have well, agreement on from the policymakers because in security we're not necessarily the policymakers on the actions that we should take somebody mentioned a, in the chat something about open a access continuum as we're seeing yeah. there's certain things like you know keeping to a data retention policy that can be automated because that's a cut and tried decision mm -hmm. but then there's things that you're saying that certain things can affect the business that needs a human to make a judgment call as you're saying all right we're mm -hmm. going to our first game here You know what others are thinking on the public interest. All right, four questions we have here connected to our four uh, to our topic today of a hacking automation. Uh, remember, getting all four correct is not easy. I I can't stress that enough. It is rare that someone gets all four correct. Here we go. First question of most average monthly search queries: What gets more, security automation or security remediation? What do you think? I'm going to go A, just because I still think that word remediation means so many different things to different people. But I'm going to say automation. Automation. Ken, where do you stand? I, I say automation as well. All right. You're both picking automation. And the correct answer is automation. Very good. Both get one point so far. Next one. What gets more, artificial intelligence <laughs> or critical thinking? What wins out here? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. this is overall, this is everybody, not just security. This people, is right? everybody. It's yeah. the, all of the Google worlds. And what time period is this uh, in the last a, month? On a month, you know, on a monthly. Yeah. They, I think it's AI months. these days, especially with the, the rise yeah, of chat GPT and yeah. So you're both saying a, or I'm sorry, yeah. C, we C. say C and D because of the, the, I thought, the I think there's people change. that are trying to figure out how to let the internet write their term papers now. I don't think how does David choose these? Them. The way I choose these, Valerie, is I just keep thinking of different ways to confuse our guests. So the correct answer is it is C, artificial intelligence. You're both two for two. You're doing very well. Could you both get four for four? We're going to find out. All right. What gets more monthly search queries? Automate the task or manual task? Automate task. Yeah, I think so. Automate task too. Automate task. Searching for manual task. No. Oh, we got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You got it wrong. Yeah. The streak is broken mm -hmm. for both of you. Let's see if you can redeem yourself for a far more difficult one. Here we go. Four options here. What gets more searches? Mm -hmm. Assignment, exercise, project, or task? Exercise. We're at the beginning the of the year, word. exercise, 100%. Yeah. It's got to be exercise. <laughs> you guys are both correct yeah. by a whopping margin. Yeah. It is exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and good point, actually. It is possibly because of the, end, the beginning of the year. That's a good point. All right. So three out of four for both of you. Good job. Congrats. Did anyone get four out of four here? Four, four, four. Yeah, it, Dwayne it, it got four out of so four. First no, time ever. That. It's not easy. Not, not easy at all. All right. Let's get back into our question. Oh, lots more questions came in. Excellent. Um, well, why do I only see one? Hold on. It says top three. Oh, it's because I was in the wrong folder. Okay. Um... Ooh, this is a really good one. I'm going to start with you, Brian, on this one. Mm -hmm. This one comes from Dwayne, who just got four out of four. Kudos uh, to you. Can you speak to the maintenance challenge of automation? This, mm. this I understand. How hard is it to adapt your automation rules as technology changes? Because your tools are oh, going to no. keep updating. They're going to drift. You, you guys still, still have still your automation. Me, uh, David Everything's died. Gonna, like, there's going to be this shift going on. Sorry, David, I'm, you cut out for me. I'm not sure if there's something going on with my connection. Can you repeat that? Yes. From Dwayne Grant, can you speak to the maintenance challenge of automation? How hard is it to 
adapt your automation rules as technology changes. You know, there's that little shift, and so one thing's ahead of the other kind of a thing. This is, I don't know how satisfying this is going to be. This is going to be a big, massive, it depends. It's kind of like, what are you yeah, automating? I know, I know Where are you automating it? How is the automation? Um, so here's a really good example. Um, so one of the things that we do is we automate open access. Um, where we go back in time and look at, say, the past four or five, six months of how people are accessing data, and we figure out, all right, I don't need 10,000 people to have access to the, the HR folder. I only need these 25 because these are the only people in applications that have been using it. it. Works really, really well. Generally, we don't see that much disruption. You start applying that same logic to data that's in, say, 365. You have to completely redo how you automate things because uh, 365 and cloud-based stores completely change the way we work. Hierarchies don't even matter anymore. I think I've told this story um, to you, David, where I was working out of somebody else's OneDrive folder for a while because they sent me a link that let me modify data in there and I didn't even know it. Like, it doesn't matter where data is. How we share and grant access to data, our IT departments aren't doing it. I'm, you know, our users are doing it just by clicking shared links. Mm -hmm. The complexity of you can share uh, access to individual files or folders or sites or team sites or OneDrive shares. The point is, Automation to solve that first problem needs to be completely reworked and redone in order to apply to the second set of problems. It really, really depends. So whereas if all you had done is gone from one NAS to the other uh, and your technology had changed, maybe the automation you had in place would be fine. It really, it really, really depends. But this is why it's so important to understand the ingredients that are going in, the changes that you're making, and the mechanism for those changes being made. Because that, at its core, that's what automation is doing. Good point. Um, any, anything to add, or I'll just go to the next question here, Ken? I, yeah, I do. Um, you have to think about it like an SDLC for the maintenance mm -hmm. of, your, of your automation. It, at the end of the day, it's a product. But it's like a continuous SDLC. It's, continuous it's, 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 SDLC. I'm going to say SDLC is always fragile. continuous. Yeah. And, the, and, and, the, and it's not like a static pod environment that you have a release cycle to. It's constantly pulling new information in. It could be threat analysis. It could be environmental changes. So... It's a bit of a sticky, uh, sticky cactus to deal with. Let me. Uh, I'm going to go uh, to Dustin Sachs' question here. Oh, before I mention that, um, our poll is live. So the bad ideas, please vote on your favorite bad idea. But you can still submit bad ideas. Remember, the winner of the best bad idea does get one of the awesome CISO series fleeces. Uh, so make sure. I'm wearing mine right now. Are you wearing yeah. it? Mine yeah. is actually technically in the wash right now. I'm actually not wearing mine. Um, it is in the wash because my wife told me it stunk. I was wearing it and she goes, I think your jacket stinks. Mine <laughs> smells like unicorns and rainbows. It's great. <laughs> so go ahead and vote for your favorite bad idea. We'll be playing the Department of Yes a second. All right. Dustin Sachs asked a question that Ian Pointer asked, which, you know, what are the prime areas we shouldn't even discuss automation, which you say, you know, nothing. But you did mention, um, and this is a question I know I've asked you and I'm sure you asked again, but mm -hmm. I think I, I would like to sort of maybe do a rapid fire of, like easy to hard of automation areas. You said, you know, deleting data, staying to your, you know, retention plan. Mm -hmm. Dustin Sachs asks, where should we it's, definitely- It's automate? funny you say that. I use that as an easy example, but I think it's clear it's not. Like if no, it was easy, everybody easy. would do it. It's really as not. Ken it's, said, yeah. he's struggling yeah. with it, right, Ken? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, okay, so tell me what, is... can you tell me what's been easy to automate? E easy is nomad signatures. I mean, known bad intelligence, automated all that, or, or automatically pulling information in from a tool is the mm -hmm. easiest thing you can possibly do. That's mm -hmm. a response. That's a detect. All right. All right. So let's go to, well, maybe not easy, but maybe first things you should automate, Brian. And we'll, I, I want to ping back, back and forth. Yeah. First things that you should automate. Um, Just say, give me so, one. So, yeah. So alert notification. This is something that we even see. It doesn't even always happen everywhere. Alerts just go into a black hole. If all you do is notify so that people can triage, you're not necessarily taking action, but that's automation in and of itself. I think the first thing to do is, it's kind of like the first step to automation is visibility. Just make sure you know what you're looking at. You can't manage what you don't monitor. Mm -hmm. All right. Ken, give me something. We'll, I just want a few of these to, to sort of get the ball rolling here. Um, yeah, I would echo on um, uh, uh, alerting, but also alerting with context. Mm -hmm. So not just a simple alert, but something that you can review. So you're not having to dive into the system to get any context to it. You, you got to put that in there right away, right off the bat. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, well, alert fatigue is well, an obvious thing here. Well, yeah, sure. No, no alerts is worse. <laughs> yeah, no alerts is worse. And also context, it's, 
So to Ken's point, um, alerts, all alerts aren't created equal. And a big part of automation is combining multiple data sources. For instance, if you get an alert that somebody has been accessing data that never touched before, if you can add the context of, oh, and by the way, it's got a bunch of PII in it or intellectual property, what have you, that is an automation step to provide, you know, to combine those data sources. It's not necessarily taking action. It's not necessarily disrupting anything, but it makes that alert so much more useful and it helps you screen them, which that's how you reduce alert fatigue. The goal should be a small number of alerts that have a lot of context. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but remember everybody vote for the for, for the bad idea. And where are we? We're 20. Uh, so we are, no, we're going to 15 minutes before we, we play our next game here. Um, from Jeff Reich just says, does the apparent fear of automation come from organizations not really knowing what they have, what it's worth and where it is? So let me ask you, where is, is it not the fear of automation or rather the fear of whatever you're going to do is going to disrupt what they already have? Either one of you jump in on that. Well, I think the fear is that you use automation that disrupt because to Ken's point, um, organizations exist for a mission. Businesses exist to make money. Mm -hmm. um, if your automation disrupts that in any way, you're causing more harm than good in yeah. many cases, not always, but in many cases. So um, the, the, I think the initial question was really smart. Um, if you don't know what you've got and, and where it is and you don't have visibility, you can't automate anything. Like you're, It's like trying to clean your garage in the dark with a lawnmower. Um, it's, <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, I, I think some of the clean. fear is the hard work it takes to get into it. Um, like, like I'd said earlier, a lot of automation is either a preconceived question or a pre-known pre response that you're going to do. And that, that's, a, that's a lot of deep diving into it. Whereas if you're manual, you can be a little you know, on the fly with it, not as impactful to, to the business itself. So if that fear, and then you have, for whatever reason, people fear their jobs. It's like the human element, mm -hmm. but they think they're going to automate themselves out of a role where the reality is automation earns more need for people. It just is a different skill set. but I've seen yes. both sides to that. Hey, uh, Justin uh, Weller asks uh, a really good question here. I like this one. And, uh, and I'll start with you, Ken, on this, because you kind of just alluded to it. Do you have any stories of automation going wrong? Yes, I have a wonderful <laughs> story. Um, you know, I worked for a pretty large organization. One thing we automated a long time ago was like phishing response. So you have folks that might identify a message that got through. It could have been, you know, a way like or simple, not, not an attachment base, but like just a, a basic start to social engineering. They report it. You have a system that analyzes that, or originally I had a person that did it. Um, but when you have a huge company, you can't have somebody looking through thousands and thousands of reported emails. You've got to put some automation in to control it. But if you don't watch your threat intelligence to that, you could have your system make a bad response. And an instance I had a long time ago was you had um, a handful of these phishing emails come in, and in the system responded back that they were good. Mm -hmm. To the reuser, the user gets response says it's good. The user's like, okay, they're like clicking links. That's the worst. Because what have it? What have you done? You mm -hmm. you have to go back and tell the user that was a bad email, so you erode your credibility. Two, you've introduced risks. You told somebody to go click the thing, and then you get into you know triage and response. So, so you, you really have created a lot more work for ones. yourself. Yeah, a lot more. This that's probably a pretty common issue because. Automation can, like, you know, with alerts, can create a ton extra work. And that's, I mean, yeah. that's where you just got to do, you know, like any rollout, you said, do your testing, which I'm sure that's what you see at the beginning and tweak and tweak and tweak. But this gets to the other question that Dwayne asked, which is, well, even if you have it wonderful today, it's not going to be wonderful tomorrow, right, mm -hmm. Brian? Yeah, so uh, you brought up a good point. Testing is is really important, but testing doesn't end, uh, right? Mm -hmm. The easiest thing for us to say is that security is a journey, but it really is. What made sense today may not make sense next quarter or next year. Um, part of implementing automation is implementing regular checkpoints where you're kind of reviewing: is this still working? Does this still make sense? Um, is this introducing more risk than we feel? Is this solving the problem that we thought thought it solved before? Um, so I think one of the one of the things that we've seen really work really, really well are security organizations that have that baked in, that there it's, you know, there's no such thing as a, a process or an automation that had a beginning and an end. There's no such thing as implementing something once and forgetting about it. Um, having a, making part of your organizational process to set aside time and resources to review, iterate, 
uh, and, 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 and retest, I think is really, really important. And I think that these are the kinds of things that help make automation or really any other process successful. Ken, I had a CISO say to me, and I remember I was at an RSA, it says, I'd like to know the thing that I implemented today, a year from now, how far from optimal am I? Like I, I said everything today, I think it's optimal, but because of drift, it's become less optimal. I'm assuming this is like an ongoing concern. Like I know at one time things were good, but I can't imagine it stayed that way. A, is that a concern you have daily? Do you revisit that at certain times? What, what do you deal with in terms yeah, of that? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a daily concern because I got much bigger fish to fry. But I am I fundamentally believe in testing. Mm -hmm. So a testing strategy for your organization, I mean, people do red teams, they do penetration tests, you do purple teams. You, to Brian's point, you need to go back to whatever you're doing in your processes. It's not just automation, it's your processes to say, are they even valid for the problem that you were trying to solve? Then you bake in, you have your automation um, team. But I, I do fundamentally believe testing and an internal testing strategy mm -hmm. is one tactic you have to have into this to make sure that whatever you're doing is even worth it and you're not burning cycles. Mm -hmm. What what uh, what stories have you seen, Brian, in terms of people sort of keeping on their automation game, like keeping it going strong you know, and so, not letting it slide too much? Yeah. So we do, one of the things that we do with anybody who works with us is we sit down every quarter and we actually go through this exercise of what were we trying to automate? Um, what were, what was the, the output? What was the outcome that we were trying to get to? Those are two different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, you had this much data that was open to everybody. Now you have this much. How has that changed over time? Are you leveraging it? Is there any roadblocks? Do you need us to do the work? Um, mm -hmm. Because everybody has to do more with less. And one of the things that we've learned over 15 years is if sometimes if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it, even if they want to. Um, so those kinds of regular reviews and also understanding what the target is that you're shooting for. Um, <laughs> your, the producer asked in the chat here, how can you make your security 10% better? And the producer was asking everybody, here's how you can answer that question. How can you make your security 10% better? Write 10% better. There are security organizations that'll just do, like, what are you measuring? Like what, what's the target that you're shooting for? <laughs> for some of us, it's just writing down, we're 10% better now, but what's the actual <laughs> metric? It's, um, and, and I think this is one of the biggest problems with automation. Somebody said in the chat, I can't find it because I don't want to keep looking over it the other way, but somebody said the best things to automate are things that are very repetitive, uh, mm -hmm. that can have a lot of impact, like high, uh, high impact, very repetitive tasks. All right. Absolutely. The stuff that would take you know, the reason we talk about open access is that you look at a folder, 40 million folders open to everybody. If you're going to fix that, you have to have a human being and it's going to take hours. There was a bank that said it was a two week change management process to do this for one folder and they spent a decade at it and never made a dent. But if you can automate that and you can do it safely and you know what the output can be and you can get that down to fractions of a second rather than hours, that is worth automating. And then you understand the output, what you're tracking, what the metric is. So it's, it's, Really, it's taking time to review what the what's the outcome you're shooting for, what's the metric you're going to measure that by, and again, what's the input and the output. And to Ken's point, regularly test it because if you're not doing that, you're just leaving a black box that, that will eventually break. I guarantee right. you. So Dust uh, Dustin Sachs says this, and I agree. How often does this actually happen, Ken? And that <laughs> is leverage automation to free humans to focus on high value work. I know that's the point of it. Is it actually happening that way, Ken? Um, in general, no, I wouldn't agree that that actually happens because you end up you'd like it to happen. The work. You'd love you'd love to say that you're <laughs> you're getting there, and maybe you free yourself up some, but you end up managing the, the automation, right? At the end of the day, so you're managing that the becomes your new job, and to have the system solve the problem, and and it it still it, it distracts you from the other high value stuff that you just have to squeeze in like you would any other um, outcome you're driving towards. All right. I want to remind everybody to click the link at the bottom of the screen to register for next week's Super Cyber Friday, Hacking Cloud Forensics. Again, very similar to today's topic. So if you're interested in today's topic, you will be interested in that as much as well. Uh, we are just six minutes away from doing our uh, Department of Yes game. So if you have not voted in the poll, get on it. Do that now, people. All right. Question from uh, Dustin Sachs who asks, how do 
you respond to people who are hesitant to leverage automation due to perceived bias of the total cost of ownership, which uh, it may not be so much of a bias because we're kind of agreeing that it does kind of cost um, development, training, maintenance, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I'm assuming you can write it out and show it. I mean, there should be a way to show a dollar amount. Ken, I mean, do you, do you, by the way, are you arguing for automation in your company and showing that it's going to save money? Um, well, yeah, but you, you don't just do automation just to automate. You're trying to, you're trying to solve a problem with speed in right. a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're automating out of a need that you have, and that already sets the deck for you. You have a problem, you've got to solve it. You can't, um, you, you're finding you can't scale with a human at a pure human um, interactive level. So you, you have to. So y yes, you do have to show the calls, but you know, as a business leader, you gotta, you gotta run your budget. And so that's how I'd manage it in my environment is I can show, hey, I can, I can fill with headcount for this problem and I can continue to scale out with heads and I can tell you the business likes that, or at least mine doesn't. Or I can show I can scale up with a tool tooling structure, have head count to manage that structure, which is more palatable, and easily show that cost over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, easy kind of make it. straightforwardly. I can show the cost. I mean, think about a rock. You can you can push a rock up a hill, or you can use a lever. You can use a bulldozer. To right. Ken's point, automation lets you solve problems that you can't solve just with headcount and it lets your headcount do more. It doesn't mean you, it reduces it. It doesn't mean, and the one thing about uh, TCO and ROI, it's always important to note some problems are just unsolvable with headcount. Um, right. And you can certainly have some operational savings, but we're in security. Mm -hmm. It's not, automation isn't always about operational savings. It's also about reducing risk, yes. right? It's about making, and, and that may not have, it, it, there's certainly an ROI. It's a little bit harder to measure you know, operational ROIs are much, much easier, but I would argue, and I think we're all kind of agreeing that operational automation doesn't necessarily free people up. It, 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 you know, forces the, the administration or the management of that automation, which is, you know, also has a cost involved, but the risk automating risk reduction is certainly possible, especially going to the, the, you know, knowing what you're measuring, what's the actual target that you're shooting for. All right. We are just a few minutes away from uh, doing our next game. And um, let me uh, go to, I think we have, uh, no, we're, we're good on that. Let me go to my questions here. Um, so let, let's just talk about success stories, all right? Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Brian, and you can tell a customer success story <laughs> or anything. Like, where have you seen the, the greatest success in, you know, like, Wow, they you know they hit it out of the park. And what what did they do to make this so darn successful? So this is a story that I've been telling for a while, ever since it happened last year. So I, I mentioned that we do these regular reviews with all of our customers, where we sit down and we look at the metrics and the business drivers. What were they trying to solve for? And what were they trying to do? And one of them was I've mentioned a couple of times cleaning up open access. We have a lot of really good wins. This one is my favorite. So this is a big manufacturing company in the UK. And I only say that because there's a turn of phrase at the end of this that's going to, that's a little, it's from the UK. So they had gone through an automation project and the goal was to get rid of open access on their NAS. It was a big NAS cluster, hundreds of millions of folders, lots of it just open to everybody. They're subject to the GDPR. Uh, they, they needed to prove that they had privacy by design and default, which meant not leaving domain users as having modify access to hundreds of millions of shared folders. So they went through this process and they they were going through the automation and then one day they got a help desk call there was a woman trying to run a report uh she she was panicking she was getting an access denied and this i found this out you know a few weeks later when we were in this review and what the CISO said because he was presenting the results to the cio what the CISO said is we kind of panicked we thought everything was about to blow up like this was the break in the dam like this mm -hmm. was the first one and we're about to get a thousand calls it's like oh no what did we break, right? What went wrong? So they gave her access very quickly. It took a couple of minutes and she was back to work. And then they said, all right, we'll pause for a second. No more calls. Said, okay, now let's take some time and do a root cause analysis. What happened? So their policy that they had decided, they had gone to their compliance and privacy team and everybody from the top down had signed off on this, was we're going to get rid of open access. But the policy is if you haven't touched data in four months, that's what we're going to take away. If you've touched it, 
great. Maybe you don't have a business need for it, but that's a different problem, right? If you haven't touched it in four months, and when they did the analysis, what they discovered was this woman had been on maternity leave for five months, um, mm -hmm. which is, it's great in the UK, you get five months of maternity leave, but she came back and she hadn't touched anything in four months. She'd been using her leave. And so what the CISO said at the end of this meeting or at the end of this part of the meeting was, it proved that the automation did what it said on the tin. Basically, the fact that we had a problem was like the exception that proved the rule. The fact that we had a problem, it worked exactly as it was designed. So this goes back to, um, I think it was Justin in the chat said, it's like, know what you're going to automate, know mm -hmm. what you're going to measure, know what the inputs and the outputs are going to be, know what the expectations are, and then review them on a regular basis. And when you do that, hopefully you do find an exception. You find where it breaks or it works as it's supposed to, even if that, in this case, you know, there was one broken dish to use a, another poor analogy. But, you, but that, I mean, that's a really good example. It's like, it's, you have to have that conversation. And this is where we have this huge mm -hmm. argument for diversity. Like if you didn't have a woman on the team <laughs> to tell you, Hey, I'm going to be on maternity leave for mm -hmm. close to half a year. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to work. Yeah, so, you're hundred percent right. An argument for diversity. All right. Oh, it's time. We got a call. Hello. Welcome to the department of yes, where no request is ever rejected. All right, we have some awful ideas, and uh, this is the way it works. The two of you have to tell me why you want to deploy this incredibly stupid idea, um, and you can't be facetious about it. You have to find the silver lining and why you want to do this, and what will be the net benefit, even though the rest of the, the house of cards will come crashing down. I want to know why you think this. So this first one comes from Brian Colt. Top voted one up. Use domain admin and root accounts for all of your automation. Brian, why do you want to do this? You know why? Because one of the hardest problems with implementing automation is where it breaks along the way. You're trying to implement complex processes that connect multiple systems together. And when something doesn't work, it can be incredibly difficult and time consuming and costly to troubleshoot that. You know how you get around that? by using domain admins for all the connections through your automation. There will never be an access denied for any of the services that are connected together. You will save on troubleshooting time. Your total cost of ownership goes way down. There's no reason not to do this. I've never heard anyone give a more compelling, convincing <laughs> answer. Yes! Excellent, all right. Ken, you've got a lot to fight for. Why do you want to do this? Use domain and admin, mm -hmm. domain admin and root accounts for all your automation. Simply put, it's for speed of your deployments. Why put all the trouble in and trying to lock down your permissions when you can just build a single account or multiple accounts all with the same permissions right off the bat? You <laughs> can um, probably cut months off of time for deployment. Your password rotation schedule doesn't matter. So you can absolutely get up and running, get to a business ORI in the quickest possible manner. I like it. You are correct. Oh, yeah! Uh, I like Dwayne's response to your comment, Brian. Damn, you almost convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one comes, um, you, this is comes from Jeff Wright, who says, automate your framework design and automate your hiring process to bring automation engineers on board. I like this. Fire mm -hmm. each automation engineer after one year since they should have eliminated their job. We'll start with you, Ken. Why do you want to do this? Well, I love this because HR processes are so slow, so time constraining. I have much more valuable things I can do. I can pop something into a system, set, forget, go have lunch, get coffee, come back, have an engineer, whenever the system can produce it to me. I don't even have to think about it. A warm body is sitting there waiting for you. I warm love body, it. Ready to go. Oh, yes, sir. All right. Let's hear it, Brian. Why do you want to do this? Because people are most productive when they have clear uh, deadlines and clear goals. If your automation engineers know that they've got exactly one year uh, to automate their processes, they are going to be working much better, much harder, much more effectively, and much more efficiently. I think one of the hardest things that we have to do in people management is ensuring that our people know what it is that they're supposed to be doing and by when. And this policy will clearly make sure that everybody knows, at least on the automation team, exactly what they're supposed to do and what happens if they don't. It's like Logan's run in your office. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> My hand is starting to blink. There you go. Has anyone, has everyone seen Logan's run? Great 70s sci-fi. Good. 
Good 75. Fine. <laughs> Highly recommended if you haven't seen it yet. All right. How much time we got left? We got 15 minutes left. And, uh, oh, I think, have we put the second poll up? The 10% be better poll is open. Let's see. Hold on. I want to see what's, what do we have on the 10%, the bad idea. You, oh, it's there. Can you, can you reorder it so the 10% better is at the mm -hmm. top? Uh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, before I even finish saying it, Aaron's on top of it. Excellent. Good job, Aaron. Um, oh, who said the survey employees on what tasks bore them the most? This is similar advice Andy Ellis has given. Automate the tasks that are at the top of the survey responses. This is spectacular advice. Who gave it? So speak up if you haven't said this. Um, this seems like the way to go, Ken, Brian. Yes? Like, mm -hmm. just find out from employees. What are they doing? Like, I'd like to not be doing this anymore. Have you done Especially this? Especially on the security team. Security talent is really, really hard. It's hard to train people. It's hard to find people. It's hard to keep people. Jeff if Wright, that security, was his. We're giving yeah, him credit. If your, people, if your security people are doing things that bore the heck out of them, find out what those are, and then invest in ways to automate that stuff. Yeah. 100%. This is great advice. And again, Andy Ellis has mentioned, Ken, have you done this before? Ask your um, team and ask everybody too. What have you done? It's part of the decision-making process and what you're going to put your efforts into because it's, it's, it's number one is problem statement. Number two is uh, tedium, as you would say, repeatability. So yeah, absolutely. We do, we do regular um, a regular cadence with our ops team to look at, um, it's really about efficiencies. So yeah, we do this. So um can, can you give me an example of something somebody said, uh, I'd like to stop doing this, and it was automated? Yeah, sandbox loading malware that we might find somewhere and having a manual task to get loaded in the sandbox. We just automated that to get a verdict. And then for oh, a second look, good. it saves so much time. That's perfect. And is, is there, let me ask you, is, is there a process in the office like, hey, everybody, this is what we used to do. Now we're doing it this way. Look how much more wonderful it is. And sort of, there's this sort of rah rah cheerleading sense of, all right, we got, you know, we got something going here. How, what can we do next? Does that happen? It, it does at many levels, but with my leadership team, you know, if I'm speak, speaking with their board, you know, I'm talking about mean time to detect, mean time to respond. And actually, there's numbers coming down that mm -hmm. it keeps everybody happy. Yeah, there's a rah rah to the team because while I did say that you don't get to do more valuable things with automation, you do. Um, even though automation is constraint and, and that, that knowledge that they, that my team gets excites them. And it, 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 it actually, um, inspires them to keep going. Well, that, this is an interesting, this is like a, a, a very, very valuable side, um, mm -hmm. product of automation is, uh, employee morale, right. Brian. Yes. Have you seen this? Uh, it depends on what you're automating for sure. Yeah. But, no, but if I someone think, says, I hate you know, if you're taking this. away the boring stuff, a hundred percent, you know, one of the <laughs> hardest things, and this is true organizationally, not just with automation, not just for security, but change is scary sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine, mm -hmm. Remember when we all went, you start, all went and started working from home and working on, I was doing 10 meetings a day on zoom. Like change was scary, even though I knew what I was doing and I knew it was, it was going well. Um, if, if, but to this point, if, if your employees, if they're asking for it, they're saying this is this is boring the heck out of me, and I'd love for this to to go away. That that's good. Just make sure you know, make sure that you market the change properly. Right. In some respect, everything that we do, even with when it's automation, marketing matters, and it, it's important that people understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the expectations are going forward. Uh, I'm going to remind everybody again. Please click the link at the bottom of the screen. Remember, if you register early by Tuesday of next week. Uh, you're automatically entered in a raffle to win an awesome CISO series jacket. So that is going to do, that link is going to disappear there. Although you can always go to our site and go to the events page to find that out. Oh, I did not mention: is anyone online right now who lives in the DC Baltimore area? If so, I'm going to be there doing a meetup uh, on um, Monday and uh, would love to meet you in person. So please come on out, or if you have friends, please come come out. Just go to the events page on uh, CISO series and you can see the link to find out where all that is. All right, let's get back to uh, questions I have. Um, how, how far have you seen companies go? I mean, you gave me a great example, but Brian, how far have mm -hmm. you seen organizations go in automation? And is there someone who's like a poster child, like, hey, re really, we should all kind of follow what they're doing? Or is everybody uh, kind of struggling with it, really? 
I well, I there it, it, there's spectrums too. Yeah. Um, you know, well, so yes, and there are also different kinds of industries are and different kinds of companies are more or less resistant to change because mm -hmm, this kind mm -hmm. whatever automation we're talking about, it is a change. There has to be an appetite for change. Um, in my two previous lives before I had this job, uh, one was at a bank, a really big bank, and the other one was at a law firm, a really big law firm. You know who doesn't like to change? <laughs> Banks and law firms. They, they yes. we yes. still had a and this is this is this isn't in the 80s. I'm not, you know, I, this this is relatively recent. This law firm still had an entire floor devoted to word processing because you know what also lawyers like printing things out and putting them on paper. So, um, by the way, lawyers, can I just say the last to adopt computers? Let's also start with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's funny you say that because there is a law firm in uh, Atlanta and they had a very forward thinking um CIO and a forward thinking CFO that saw the benefits of some of this stuff. So they have, so anybody who knows legal technology or just law firms in general, you have clients and those clients have matters. You generally tend to organize things by client matter. They had set up an entire process and we work with them on this where every single client matter had a data owner. Every data owner reviewed access to that client matter on a regular basis. It was quarterly. Any access to client matter data went through that data owner. So they had an audit record and a paper trail and a you know, basically a breadcrumb trail of who asked for access, when it was approved, who approved it, why it was approved, how long that person had it, when it was taken away, how often it was reviewed, and they could report any paralegal that was on any one of these client matters had a method to report to any client exactly who had access to their data. Now, this was not a painless process to implement. They had to do a lot of restructuring of data and a lot of restructuring of permissions and Active Directory groups, and then they used us to do some of the automated processes that I just talked about. It was Obviously, there was a cost associated with it. It took time. It took energy. Mm -hmm. But the end result, the outcome was they had a competitive advantage over every other law firm in the area because part of their sales pitch, especially to enterprise customers, were that they could say, we could prove to you that we know exactly who has access to your confidential information that you give to us. We can prove mm -hmm. to you that we review it on a regular basis and you know exactly who it does. And we can prove to you that while we have clients all over the country and all over the world, none of them will ever get access to any of your intellectual property or other proprietary information. That was a competitive advantage for them. We, we all know that good IT and good process, IT processes and good technology and good automation can be a competitive advantage, but you gotta have, you gotta have some, you know, you gotta, you, you, you got to see the um, so that I'm working uh, looking for. You got to be able to see, you know, what, not just what right looks like in the forest for the trees, but you got to you got to understand the art of the possible. Like, what could if we could automate this? What would be the benefits of doing this? Because they didn't do it for fun. You know, nobody invests in technology. No company invests in technology because it's it's cool or it's fun. As much as maybe we'd like to, you do it because we're a company. It's either going to save us money or it's going to make us money. And in this case, the investment was worth it for them. Ken, this is what you were referring to, like, you know, we're in a business here and we, we just two very obvious side benefits of, or not side, or not side benefits, the reason you do automation, quite the opposite, mm -hmm. and that is improve well, processes and employee morale and competitive nature. I mean, that I'm sure your business likes to hear, like, we're going to do this to make you more competitive. I, Have I, you I, had an opportunity? I can give you a wonderful example. Is I've been with my company for a while, and I am identity and access management. It's one of the first things you need to think about automating in any sizable company. You cannot keep up; it's impossible. We were under manual processes. We're maybe a six thousand person company, then we're, we're over twenty thousand now. And I came to the business saying, "I'm going to automate this," and they were very apprehensive. They were very nervous. But we're the type of company that does an acquisition almost every single week. And it's a rip and replace model, but still, that's a lot of people. And we have a high margin of turnover just because we're tied to a blue collar industry. And they were very nervous about me automating this thing, that it's going to disrupt everybody. But we went through the same thing I talked about a moment ago, um, a pilot of how it would work. We ate our own dog food to show how we could automate our own, um, own mills. We showed the benefit of it because it meant we used a source of truth like your HR system to provision this and we showed that we could do the things in real time. And then we showed how you shrunk five days, two weeks worth of effort to a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So um, the competitive advantage to that for us is that we're in acquisition growth mode. It costs money for a person who can't make you money. 
So we could show a true ROI and show a benefit right back, which helps us beat our competition, which we continue to do. I'm not saying I enterprise all of it, but I can tell you it's a big part to it for a people centric company. I think right. Ken's asking for a raise. <laughs> he's, he's doing his effort. All right. Stay right there. I'm going to do quickly wrap up the show and then I'm going to want to get final thoughts from both of you. Uh, so by the way, if anyone, if you have not already click the bottom of the button at the bottom of the screen to register for next week's event, could you do that right now? Because we're going to change it in just a moment. You only have about a minute or two for that link to be there, but you know, again, you can always go to the site, but why not just click it right now? Again, it's not going to take you out of this conversation. So hacking cloud forensics, that's next week's show. Um, hey, as I said, register early, get that awesome CISO series jacket. Huge thanks to our sponsor, Veronis, for making this episode happen. That is Brian's awesome company. Uh, for your automation needs, I would talk to Veronis if you have them. If you want to know how to be more competitive, make the employees a lot happier, give them a holler, especially around your data, because that's what they know how to do. Starting in 90 minutes from now, or actually 95. Uh, 3 30 p.m. Eastern, 12 30 Pacific, cybersecurity headlines, week in review. Our guest today is George Finney, the CISO of Southern Methodist University. He's also written a few books. This will be on our CISO Series YouTube channel. So please go to the CISO Series YouTube. It's youtube.com slash CISO Series. Pretty easy to find. Um, stick around for our meetup. Now, Aaron, you can change the link at the bottom of the screen. Um, there, please join us CISO Series Meetup after today's chat. You can click on that now if you want to get in the chat. It is on another platform called uh, Toucan. It's a ton of fun. Simulate discussions. Drift in and out of conversations. Don't feel rude about bouncing from one person to the next. Just go ahead and do it and participate. It's a lot of fun. Hey, tell your friends to join us. We do this every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's more fun when there are more people here. And I know a lot of you are watching but you're not participating. I would like it if you would participate as well. It's more fun. As you can see, the people who are participating have a lot of fun. And if you want to sponsor a Super Cyber Friday, just email me at david at CISOseries.com. We got availability starting in March. We would love to have you on board. All right, let's wrap up. I will start with you, Brian. We just have, oh, we actually have three minutes left. Um, last thoughts, anything you want to suggest, offer to our audience? I'm sure Veronis is hiring, yes? Uh, we are. Uh, we absolutely are hiring in, in both incident response and engineers and all kinds of things. So veronis.com slash careers, we have uh, we're grown as fast as we possibly can. Um, and if you have never done one, I know Ken did one because that's how we met, uh, do a risk assessment with us. And now we're a SaaS, so it's even easier. Just give us a VM and we'll start answering easy. all these questions. We yeah, talked super, about super this. Easy. Crazy, crazy easy. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to hook in. Yeah. Well, we do have oh, to hook in, but we don't need right. to go rack and stack hardware or anything. That's what it's I mean. Just, hook, hook yeah, you spin up a physical. VM and, and we host everything and we do all the hard work for you. Exactly. And one of the things that we've realized to the point of this entire episode is that automation is only as good as the people running it and how often you review it. We do all the hard work because we realized if we didn't do it, nobody else would. So um, help us help you. Excellent. And I'm assuming best way to connect with you is on LinkedIn. Yes. LinkedIn's a good one. Yeah. All right. Brian, and you'll be at the, our meetup immediately after this, yes? Yes, I will. All right. Ken, any last thoughts? And are you are you happy to be hiring, by the way? Yeah, yes, we are hiring. You're free to connect to me on LinkedIn, check our job board. Um, you know, we're looking for folks in compliance, risk compliance, engineering, and um, our security ops. Um, biggest thing is 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 automate based on need. Um, build your business case, stick to your business case partner with your business stick with the business and i love the competitive examples uh about making the make the business happy i mean that's really the way to go to uh automate based on need simple as that can all right well let me wrap this suck, suck up we got less than we got about 60 seconds left uh thank you again to our guest ken collins with sunbelt rentals also brian betchy over at veronis thanks huge thanks to veronis thanks to our community as well but by the way, Matthew Bybee, who's been in the chat room for God knows how long, he's going to be on an upcoming episode, I believe, at the end of February. So make sure you guys are sticking around for that. He'll be on that one. Um, thank you, everybody. Please click the link at the bottom of the screen and join us for the meetup. Aaron, our producer, and also Andrew. Aaron has been running all the shows, so huge thanks to Aaron as well for making everything happen as smoothly as it does. It does not go this smoothly by accident. I will just warn, tell everyone, it takes talent 
in the background who is actually manually doing things to make it happen. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take us out, Aaron. Click the link at the bottom of the screen. Join